you ready for the word today? Are you ready to be responsive to the word of God today? Like, shout back at me. We're, we've been in a series called What's In It For? What's In It For Us? Did you know it or did you cheat? It's on the screen. It's What's In It For Us? And that is actually the question that generosity asks. Selfishness asks the question, what's in it for me? Even charity just asks the question, oh, what's in it for you? And you can just give. But a life of generosity actually asks the question, what's in it for us? Because I understand that my life is to be a channel, a conduit of the goodness of God. Remember, we've been talking about the flow. This is uh, repeating for those of y'all that missed class the last few weeks. We've been talking about a flow that God wants to get a blessing from him to you through to somebody else. And you don't want to block the flow with stinginess or with greed, but you want your life to be an open channel so that generosity can flow through you. Somebody say flow. Look at your neighbor and say, don't block my flow. Look back at that neighbor and say, you the one that's blocking it. <laughs> it's funny, in, in, in this room are water pipes. In, these, in this room are water pipes. And how many you know the purpose of water pipes are not to get wet? It's not the purpose of, of water pipes. So you can't even listen to a series like this and think, oh, this is just about you being blessed, although God does want you to be blessed. No, the purpose of the water pipe is just to be a channel, to flow, to get the water through. But in the process... The water pipe gets wet. And you just say, God, let my life be a conduit to somebody else. And so that's what we've been talking about. And I'm going to add another layer to it today. So stand with me to honor the reading of God's word. And I want you to go with me to the book of Malachi. Malachi chapter 3. And I want to look at verses 6 through 12. Malachi chapter 3. Start at verse number 6 and we'll land at verse number 12. How y'all doing way back there in the back? Y'all good? <laughs> no, it's cool, it's cool. It's been a rough morning. It's been a rough morning. Malachi chapter 3. We'll start at verse number 6. When you're ready to read it, say yeah. If you need some time to find it, say hold on. I'll wait for you. It's Old Testament. It's Old Testament. It's Old Testament. Sometimes it takes a while. It is the last book of the Old Testament. If you're struggling, go to the book of Matthew and then just back that thing up one page. Biblically, back it up. One page. Amen. Keep it in church. Malachi chapter 3. And look at what it says. I, the Lord, do not change. I like when I read scripture and it's good in the first few words. I, the Lord, do not change. Only the Lord can say that. If you meet anybody in your life and they look at you and they say, I do not change, red flag, red flag. <laughs> Because they should be changing because you are not perfect. You are in the perfecting process every single day. You should be being conformed to the image of Jesus. But because God is perfect, because God is good, because God is consistent, he does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. How many are thankful that when other people are fickle, God is not? He's like, yo, I am consistent. I don't change. It's good news. He says, so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of our ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me. Return to me. And I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? in tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test, somebody say test. That is a big word, say test. Say it with your chest, say test. Ooh, that is the only time in scripture that you will ever hear God say, test me in it, try it. Just, just ooh, God pulls one of these. You ever heard somebody say, I wish you would? That's what he's saying right there. Test me. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says, not a preacher, the Lord Almighty. 
then all the nations will call you blessed for yours will be a delightful land says the Lord Almighty can you say amen, amen. come on say amen again amen. prophet Malachi is given the word of the Lord and God says test me in this now I want to add one more verse to this y'all good for one more verse Psalm 34, verse number 8. I want you to look at this. It says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in their 401k. My bad, new glasses. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in their stocks and in their financial portfolio. No, blessed is the one that takes refuge in the man that they found that has a good job with benefits and is fine. No, my bad. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. But you got to taste and see that the Lord is good. So Malachi, God says, put it to the test. And the psalmist says, taste and see. So we got to test and we got to taste. Ooh, last week I talked about the treasure trap. This week I want to talk to you about the taste test. The taste test. Would you help me preach? Look at just one neighbor, just one neighbor. This might be the last time. I don't know. Look at just one neighbor. Say, oh, neighbor. You've got to experience the taste test. Find you another neighbor, the one you ignored. Come on, find them. Come on. Say, other neighbor. It's close to lunch. I know you're hungry. You look like you are. <laughs> so there's a taste test. If you believe God's going to speak, would you give us some praise? <laughs> Ooh, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Speak to our hearts today. Uh, help my cowboys win. In Jesus' name, everybody say You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. The taste test. I don't know if it's too early to disclose this information to you. You have to understand that Social Dallas is only seven months old. Seven months old, we planted this church. And I'm proud to announce to you today that in just seven months, I already know who my successor is going to be. I already know. In case you were nervous and you were worried, like, who's going to take over social when Pastor Robert is gone? I already know who my successor is. I'm such a visionary leader. There is no success without a successor, and I found my successor. I don't think it's too early to let you know. In fact, my successor is here in church today. My successor is here. They're here. Not in this room. Not in this room. They're in another room. And I'll go ahead and put up a picture of my successor so you can see. This is my successor right here. That's who's taken social Dallas <laughs> when I'm done that is my youngest little human Remington Elaine Madu she is four years old going on 34 and she is she's gonna take it over she's gonna take over the church you say well how did you pick it I picked it this week I picked it this week I walked in true story on my kids playing church at home that's what you do when your kids are church planters they when your parents are church planters you play church and I watched, I watched, and my son, Robert Madu III, my man-child, my namesake, he went straight to praise and worship. So he's on the praise and worship team. He was singing, oh, man, and he kept dipping his knee on the man part. I don't know what was up with that. And then my oldest, Everly, she was over social kids. She was over social kids. She had her stuffed animals, and she was over social kids. And then dead center, Right there, Remington Elaine, I call her Remy Ma. She's there with the microphone, a.k.a. the hairbrush, and she's looking at all of them saying, you have to obey his commandments. True story. Shout out Miss Simmons holding it down in social kids. So she's going to take over the church. I already know that she's going to do it. I also know where I'm going to work when I retire. So when I hand it to her and I retire, I know where I'm going to work. It confuses some of you because you're like, wait a minute. Aren't you supposed to stop working when you retire? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You understand the theology of work according to the Bible, that God never intended work to be a curse, but work is a gift. Work is a gift from God. Please understand that work preceded the fall of man. It preceded the fall of man. Genesis chapter 2, read it when you get to the crib. Before Adam ever committed an S-I-N, he had a J-O-B. As a matter of fact, before Eve ever came in the picture, he had a J-O-B, and he had a place of residence called the Garden of Eden. Oh, ladies, for real, y'all not going to shout at that part? My goodness. Had a job, had a place to stay, because work is not evil. 
That was in God's original intention. Why? Because he says, I speak creation into existence. That's my part. It is your job to manage it. It's your job to steward it. Stewardship was in God's original intention. Work is not a curse. The ramification of the fall was not to bring work, but frustration came with work after the fall of man. He said, by the sweat of your brow, you're going to work. He said, I've always had work, but now you're going to be frustrated when you do it. You're going to toil the ground. But work was always in God's original intention because God loves stewardship. God was singing it before the psalmist. Work, 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 work. I don't know what she says in the middle. That's tongues. I need the interpretation. But work. (laughs) It's got to work. So uh, when I retire... I know where I'm going to work. I've never said this publicly. I've never said this in a sermon. I know exactly where I'm going to work when I retire. And I'm not going to be doing it for income. I'm going to be doing it for interaction with people, okay? I'm going to be like 80 years old, 80 years old. That's when I'm retiring. And I'm going to work at a store. I'm going to work at a store that I believe is a godsend. I believe the anointing and the favor of God rest on this particular store. This store is massive. This store is anointed. I think this store is a preview of heaven. Yes, because you can't just walk up in this store any kind of way. No, you can't come in the store whenever you want. That's Home Depot. This store is different. You got to have a membership to get in this store. They will check. They'll make sure your, la- your name is recorded in the Lamb's computer of like, I'm, you know what store I'm talking about. Costco. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm working at Costco. I can't get a Costco praise in here. On us. If you ain't praising, you ain't been before. Costco? Costco is incredible. I'm telling you, God's favor rests on Costco. What other store can you have all your needs met at one single store? Pull up on Costco. Put gas in your tank. Get your tire changed. Get an eye exam. Get you some flat screen TVs. Get you patio furniture. Get you a lawnmower. And then get you toilet tissue and paper towels in bulk to last you in case there's another shutdown. You know you still got enough. Tell you, Costco, it's amazing. And if all that wasn't enough for Costco, they have these people that are stationed throughout Costco. Anybody know what I'm talking about? In fact, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do when I'm old. I'm letting you know my retirement plan. They have people in Costco, and they are stationed behind little desks like this, hairnet, crazy glasses, and they're smiling. And their job is to stand behind that little desk and offer you free samples. Ladies and gentlemen, there is nothing more generous than free samples. I don't care who you are. I don't care who you voted for. I don't care your color, culture, creed, or kind. Everybody loves free, and everybody loves food. When you put free and food together, how many know powerful things begin to happen? Just standing there (laughs) waiting to give you free food. And the miracle, I was thinking about this, it's not just in the free food. It's not just the free food that's the miracle. It's that it's free food in Costco. Free food in the confines of Costco. Think about it. If the same person with the same hairnet was standing on the side of the road with food, with toothpicks in it, talking about pull over. I got some free food for you. Ain't no way in the world you pulling over to get that free food. If you pull over, it's to call the police. Say, please, get this psycho out here (laughs) giving out free sandwiches with toothpicks in it. But not at Costco. This is what I'm going to do when I retire. I'm just going to stand here and I'm going to give people free samples. I want the human interaction. I want to watch you. Roll up in there. Just came to get batteries. And then smell this teriyaki chicken or whatever I got over here. And I wanted to draw you over here. I found this out this week, and this is going to bless somebody that's been living in condemnation. I found out that you are allowed to get more than one sample. Doesn't that free you? You ain't got to go to different aisles and change outfits and come back like you somebody. <laughs> no, it's Costco law. It's Costco law. They have to give you as many as you want. And here's why they have to give you as many as, they, as, they want, as you want. Because, number one, it's not theirs. It's a big principle. They don't own it. It's not theirs. Not only that, they have to give you as many as you want because there's a surplus. There is a whole lot. They got a whole pallet of it in the bag. They might not have cooked some more, but please believe they got plenty. They did not run out no matter what they tell you. And then I also found out that it's not like they get paid more or any less whether you get some or not. It's just on you. So get as many as you want because Costco 
is just hoping that you will take that sample. And when you have a bite mm, of that sample, they're hoping that the sample will draw you in to the surplus. They are hoping, Costco the only place, that will give you a free piece, hoping that that free piece will entice you to go, give me a whole pallet of that macaroni and cheese, all of it. They're giving you a piece so you can see the power and what they have behind the back and that there is more. Ooh. And when I work at Costco, when I'm 80 years old, I ain't going to be that dude that says, only one. I'm going to be so generous. <laughs> so take as many as you want. But if I see you keep coming back, and you keep coming back, <laughs> and you keep coming back every month just to get a sample, at some point in love, in love, I'm going to look at you and say, yo, why would you settle for the sample when there's a surplus? Why would you come in here every day getting five and six samples, bite size, when there is a whole surplus behind me? I feel like a Costco sampler today because today my assignment is clear. I want to teach you a principle, and I mean teach. I want to teach you a principle that I don't just know in my head, that I didn't just hear some other pastor preach about it. I want to teach you a principle that I have been living in my life. I want to teach you a principle that ever since God has ever blessed me with resources, I have implemented this principle in my life. And I can tell you that the blessing, the favor, the goodness of God that is on my life is direct result of this single principle. It's the principle of tithing. Tithing. That's what I want to teach you today, the principle of tithing. Now, I have to tell you, um, I feel like I got home court advantage because I have parents who were super saved. Amen. And we had to be in church. And from the time I was young, they not only taught me the principle of tithing, but the principle of giving, of offering. So this is almost just like second nature to me. I was, I was raised in this. I'll never forget uh, being in kids' church. And before my Nigerian daddy and my mama would drop me off at kids' church, they would hand me my offering to put in the offering. They would hand it to me. Ooh, and I'll never forget. I'll never forget one day. My dad handed me an offering. And I was going to put it in the plate. I was going to do it. But I walked past the vending machine. And how many know Reese's peanut butter cups will call your name every once in a while? And I'll never forget this. I couldn't have been more than eight years old. And I saw the Reese's peanut butter cups. And I put that offering money in the vending machine. I had the Reese's peanut butter cups. My kids' church pastor saw me. I put it in my pocket. Got in the car when my dad and mom picked me up and made the mistake of opening up the Reese's peanut butter cups in the car. Soon as the package opened, what is that? Says my peanut butter cups. Where did you get peanut butter cups? I said, from the vending machine. With what money? I, with, uh, did you take the money that I gave you for the offering and put it in the vending machine? Oh, it was a dark day in the Toyota that day. When I tell you. <laughs> oh, my dad. Don't you ever steal from God, okay? I said, what? Well, I got it from you. I know. It's the same thing. No. <laughs> but but this, is what I, this is what I grew up in. I just grew up. Understanding the principle of tithing is just natural, the principle of offering and giving. And now I've done it in every message in this series. Let's just go ahead and address the elephant in the room. Because how many of you know when it comes to church, whenever you start talking about money, people get funny. Some of you already, I can see your face like, here we go again. I was waiting to come to social. And of all the Sundays, here they go talking about money. And I've been sharing that the reason we're talking about money is because Jesus, more than prayer, more than faith, talked about money in the Bible. And how many know if Jesus talked about it, I think the church today should talk about what Jesus talked about. Can I get an amen in here today? I think we should talk about it. Because money reveals your heart and we should talk about what Jesus often talked about parables about money he often spoke about what you do with what is in your hand but if you're in here today and you're like here we go again I feel you I feel you because part of the problem with people acting funny when we talk about money part of the problem is on preachers amen <laughs> preachers have jacked this up a little bit in the way that we communicate about offering, especially about tithe. I heard some preachers, they do this approach. It's uh, what I call the mafia approach. 
<laughs> it's like God is the Godfather. And he's trying to get his 10%. He's like, I told you. Why don't you bring my 10%? I don't want to have to send them after you. <laughs> so <laughs> you scared. Like, all right, God, don't, <laughs> don't kill me in the alley. Here's your 10%. It's like God going to get you <laughs> if you don't give. Another approach is, oh, God is broke. You ever heard that preacher like, come on, y'all. Please, Gillies is expensive to rent, y'all. You think these lights are free? You see this LED screen? Come on, y'all, please help us out now. You know God, God needs it. Like God is in heaven broke, struggling. Tell me, y'all, no, y'all see the roof leaking? That's his tears coming down. That ain't just water. He's sad. <laughs> Come on, how many been to a church, had a building fund, and they never put nothing in the building? Like, where is this money going? <laughs> so that's one approach. God, God is broke. The, the, the other approach is, oh, oh, this is the craziest one, um, as if God is a cosmic slot machine. And so then you got preachers that saying stuff on his behalf that you can't even back up. I'm telling you right now, you sow a seed of $10. He's going to give you $10,000 before 10 o'clock. Give it to me now, I'm telling you. As if God is a vending machine in Vegas and you just put it in, he's going to give it right back to you. Using all kinds of scriptures out of context. I'm telling you, Leviticus 15.10 says this. If you don't give $1,510, what? That, that, that's not my approach today. That will never be my approach. My approach today is to get this in your heart and in your spirit, the joy of giving. Oh, I want you to have a life of generosity that says not I have to, but I get to. That God would actually use me just to be a channel, just to be a conduit of blessing to give it to somebody else. Not I have to, not I got to, but I get to. And it starts with this principle of tithing. Now, how many were here last week when I preached about the treasure trap? How many were here last week? Okay. Last week, please go back and watch that message because I talked about it. I, I had money on my eyes, on sunglasses, and I said money has a power that many of us don't realize. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is giving his famous sermon on the mount, and he says very clearly that you cannot serve God and money. He said nobody can serve two masters. You're going to love one or you're going to hate the other. He said, you cannot serve God and money. Think about that. He doesn't say you cannot serve God and sports. He doesn't say you can't serve God and your spouse. He says you cannot serve both God and money. He's saying that is the power of money. He said that money, there is no in between. It'll either be your master and you will serve it. Or you will master it and it will serve you and you will use it as a tool to further the kingdom of God in the earth. But there is no in between. And if you don't understand the power of money and how insidious greed is and how it can creep in your heart, then you will never get free from the trap of it. But you have to see the greed that it so easily gets in your heart. Because let's be honest, all of us think we're generous. Any person you say, you're like, man, you stingy. Oh, no, I'm not. I remember. Remember that one time? Remember that one time? You didn't have no money? I, I cash at you, $5.33. Remember that time? No, there was a dude one time on the side of the road, and I could have drove by. I acted like I didn't see him at first, but then I stopped, and I rolled down my window, and I get. Everybody will go to the one time they were generous. Everybody thinks they're generous, and nobody thinks they're greedy. Have you noticed this? Th this is the challenge of life, is money will blind your eyes, and you won't even see the greed in your own life. You can't tell on you, I'll tell on me. You want to check where money is in your life? Always check the thing that you don't have to think about to spend money on. Like it's like whenever you get to whatever that is, it's like money just pew, comes out of your wallet. It's like, oh, I don't even think twice about it. Because whatever that is, hear me, it is actually a revealer of an idol in your life. And everybody has different ones. Everybody has different ones. You can't tell on you, I'll tell on me. You know what mine is? Ooh, close. I can shop. I have an anointing to shop, yeah. I'm telling you, I'm gonna think twice about it. A pair of shoes, I can, I can, I've always been a tither. Always been generous in offering, trying to grow in generosity every day. But I'm telling you, I don't have to think about it. I can see the outfit and know where I'm gonna wear it at. Already, line it up from different stores. Outfit from three months ago. Oh, that'll coordinate with that and put it together over here. That is mine. And money is a revealer of idols in your life that you have to check. You know what it reveals in me? That one of my idols 
is appearance and how I look. And so I constantly have to check. I have a friend, he can walk in any store. He looks, he looks regular, he don't ever shop. But he can't go up in a Barnes and Nobles without dropping serious money. Oh, he has, I mean, his library collection is ridiculous. I'm like, look at my shoe collection. He's like, look at my library. <laughs> he will buy a book in a minute. You know what his idol is? He loves to be looked at as the smart person. There is an affirmation he gets from knowing it all, and he gets on my nerves. <laughs> Don't you hate those people that know everything? You're like, yeah, man, that happened in 1985. Uh, actually, 1982. <laughs> Close enough, bro. He, he, that, that's his thing. Everybody has something. And so I asked you this week, how do you know? What, what's the number? How many shoes is too many shoes? How many golf clubs is too many golf clubs? How many trips is too many trips? Put an amount on it. You see the power of greed? But when it comes to generosity, God says, if you want to see where to start with generosity, I have a number. And it's the tithe. It is 10%. So that everybody, irrespective of your income, the amount won't be the same, but the sacrifice will always be equal. That here is a starting point for generosity, and it is called the tithe. Are y'all all right? Now, let's, let's be very practical. What is a tithe? What is a tithe? Before I tell you what it is, let's talk about what it's not. It is not this. <laughs> Pastors don't always enunciate. So, I never got, I've had multiple people, believe it or not, who say, yeah, Pastor, I brought my tithe and offerings. I'm like, please keep your detergent, okay? That is a tithe. <laughs> it's a tithe, tithe. It's not that. Uh, tithe, it comes from the Hebrew word maser, which means a tenth. Everybody say a tenth. Come on, say a tenth. It is, it is a tenth. It is a tenth of what? A tithe is a tenth of everything or whatever God has blessed me with. A tithe is a tenth of whatever God has blessed me with. If God has blessed you with anything, 10% of it is a tithe. You make... $1,000 was the tithe. How much? Checking your math skills, okay? <laughs> it's, it's, it's a t I, I have 10 pieces of cheese. God's blessing me. First of all, whose is this? It's Costco's, but you're right. <laughs> it's God's. That's the fundamental understanding is that I don't own anything. This is not mine. None of it is mine. God just gave it to you. Well, I work very hard. Who gave you the strength to work? Who gave you the mind to work? Who put the breath in your body? Who made you get that job and position? Who opened doors for you? Who's the one that gave you the strength? You knew how you were in college. It was not your own ingenuity that got you to walk across that stage. It was nothing but the goodness of God who made sure that you were born in this time and this dispensation. You could have been born in the depression but God just saw fit that you would be born in this time period for this purpose for this assignment everything you have is not because of your goodness it's because of the goodness and the grace of Jesus Christ you don't own anything you are a manager and a steward of it some of y'all scaring me because you sitting up there like you woke yourself up this morning and that everything you have in your life is because of what you did but is there anybody on here that understands it was God that blessed me with everything I got. I owe him everything. I owe him everything. That's the fundamental principle you have to understand. I am a steward and a manager. I don't own anything. A tithe is a tenth. Whatever he bless you with. Old school trick, let's get real practical. Whatever your paycheck is, move the decibel over one time to the left. Is that right? Yeah. I'm English, not math. Just move it over. A tithe is a tenth. A tithe is a tenth. Why is it a tenth? Because 10 in the Bible, hear me, it represents test. It represents testing. 10 in the Bible is always God trying to get you to obey the word that he said. 10 in the Bible is a number of testing. If you look in the book of Genesis, you'll see these words, and God said 10 times 
you'll see. And God said, why? Because a tithe is a test. A test of what? A test of your obedience. How many plagues were there in Egypt? Ten. Because each time, God was trying to test the heart of Pharaoh. From Adam to Noah, there were ten generations. Ten generations of disobedience, which is why there was a flood that was sent. Because whenever you see ten, ten is the number of testing. It is the number of God testing your obedience. How many commandments were there? Ten commandments. Because ten is a number of testing. In the New Testament, there's a parable of Ten virgins, ten bridesmaids, five were foolish, five were wise, because ten is the number of testing. The tithe is a test. A test for what, Robert? It is a test to see whether you trust God, whether you trust him. Look at what it says in Genesis 14. This is the first time we see that word tithe in the Bible. It says, then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Pause. Old Testament is simply a shadow of what Christ is in the New Testament. Whenever you're reading the Old Testament, look for blues clues for Jesus. Because that's one book about one person, his name is Jesus. So this Melchizedek, this king, this is actually a foreshadowing of Jesus. How do you know that? Salem means peace. So you got a king of peace who brought bread and wine. This is Jesus. He was a priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abraham, saying, Blessed be Abram. By God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything, a tithe of everything. Please don't miss this. Abraham has just won a battle. He just won a victory. And as a result of the victory, he goes, Ooh, I would not have gotten the victory if it had not been for God. And he gives Melchizedek a tenth. He did not give a tenth before as if God was a cosmic slot machine trying to get something. He says, no, I'm giving out of response to the goodness of God. Generosity is a response to the goodness and the grace of God. I am only generous to the degree that I see the grace and the goodness of God in my life. Can I get an amen in here today? So tithing is always a test. It's a test of your obedience. It's a test of trust. But since I got my Costco samples, here's what I want you to get in your head today. I think it's a taste test. I think the tithe is a taste test. Let me explain. You, you ever done a taste test? That's what you do at Costco. You know how it is. You weren't even thinking about the food. You came to get batteries. Here you are getting the batteries. You're like, is that, is that, what? And the aroma calls you to come over to what will be my stand when I'm 80. And you, you smell it. You ask a question. Uh, excuse me, what is this? You ain't never just grabbed it. Uh, what is this? That's what makes me laugh about Costco. Even stuff that we already know, we act like we had never seen it before. What, what is that? <laughs> Fried chicken. Oh, they fry it. <laughs> oh, that made me laugh. Uh, <laughs> so, so you ask questions so you can get some knowledge. What, what is it? Oh, really? Okay, well, can I? Of course, take as many as you want. And then you, you take one. What do you do next? You don't put it straight in your mouth. <laughs> smell it. <laughs> After you smell it, investigate it, see it again. Then you eat it. Then you rate it. Isn't that what you do? That's a taste test. And that's how this kingdom operates, the kingdom of this world. Because the kingdom of this world is what? See, then taste. The kingdom of this world needs knowledge, needs facts, needs to see it on paper and make sure it lines up with the budget, make sure it's fiscally responsible, and if it makes sense, and if I smell it, then I'll taste it. Because the kingdom of this world is see and taste. God says, I'm trying to get you to step into a taste test and if you want to ever see my goodness, oh, I feel like preaching. If you ever want to see my blessing, don't come into my kingdom with see and taste. Remember what the psalmist said, taste and see that God is good. You got to embrace it first. And as you do it, you will see the goodness. If you're waiting to see it, you'll never live by faith and you'll never get the blessing. And it won't make sense on paper, but it will make sense in the kingdom. If you say, God, I'm going to taste and see. Many people don't tithe and don't give. Why? I need to see it first. 
And it doesn't make sense. You, oh, really? 90 is more than 100. Okay, not in my math. And that's why you live under the curse. Because you're waiting to see it. I love what one pastor said, and he's pastored longer than me, so I know it's true, but I can testify to what he said. He said, tithers and non-tithers always have the same testimony. They always have the same testimony. Tithers always have this testimony. Whew, I'm blessed. Doesn't mean you got a Bentley and live in a 50,000 square foot house, but they'll say, man, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm, I'm blessed. Doesn't mean you don't have problems. Doesn't mean you shouldn't still have good stewardship, but they'll say, I'm blessed. And every person that doesn't tithe, they always have the same testimony too. I can't afford to. I can't. I don't see how it makes sense. And if you're waiting to see it, you'll never taste the goodness of it today. Hear me. This is a preacher who's not looking for you to pay no bills. We good. We're looking for a preacher. This is a preacher that's telling you this is a principle in the word of God that if you could get it, it will release blessing in your life. What, what tenth should I give? That's important. Because tithing is not only a test. It is a test, watch this, of what you put first. In order to trust, it must be first. Proverbs chapter 3 says, honor the Lord with your riches and bring him the first fruit. Please don't miss this. It's not a tithe if it's not first. Leviticus chapter 27 verses 30 and 32 says, this is God talking. He says, a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Every tithe of the herd and flock, every tenth animal that passes under the shepherd's rod will be holy to the Lord. It, it's not a tithe if it's not first. Ten pieces of cheese, the first is his. That's God. I have the other nine. But you know how a lot of people give, this is your cheese, this is your paycheck. Here's how a lot of people, when they get their paycheck, what's the first thing you cut? That mortgage, that rent, the rent is real. So the first chunk goes. Got to pay my rent. I'm not trying to be out on the street. Pay my mortgage, pay my rent. What you do next with it? Oh, car. Got to pay that car. No, see, you should have got a key, but now you're trying to ball out or something. <laughs> There's my car payment. So you give the car. And then what else you, what else you got? Which, oh, our generation, especially millennials, have more credit card debt, school loan debt than any other generation. So let me go pay that debt down oh, gotta pay the debt credit card debt and that interest <laughs> let's see what else oh gotta eat out gotta eat out <laughs> come on DoorDash, hallelujah <laughs> gotta eat what else netflix hulu gotta watch something you squid games all of it you're trying to be here in, in the dark let's pay all that what else what else uh, huh? Lights, pay for the lights, yeah. TXU, hallelujah. Pay for my lights, what else? What? Oh, internet, phone bill. Come on, I got a following, I'm an influencer. <laughs> this is work, scrolling is work. What else, what else? Um, uh, oh, your boo, your boo. Come on, spouse, order one you're trying to get, hallelujah. Get them something to, and once we paid all that, somebody said lights, somebody shouted out other stuff, and then once we've done all that, <laughs> then we come to church, and like, well, pastor been preaching on being generous, and I am generous. Let me get a little bit of this. Don't you love the people that still put change in <laughs> What? What? It's still money? What? <laughs> all right, all right. Here. What's in it for us? Here. Here. You laughing, but it's happening. <laughs> you 
want her, but you don't ever have enough. It's not a tithe unless he's first. I know it doesn't make sense, not, but you can't see it. You've got a taste first. Here's what God wants from you. God says, if you would just flip it, if you would just stop waiting to see if you can afford it, you'll never afford it until you step out and do it. Say, God, all right. He says, put me to the test. Look, he says, I wish you would. Okay, God. Ooh, it hurts. But I'm going to do it. I'm going to give you. Ooh, have you ever given sacrificially? <laughs> you ever put something in there and be like, watch the go down? I didn't even tell the first service. I'll never forget. I've, I've always trusted God with tithing. I always trusted God with tithing. And I'll never forget, there's a season in my life, I was so faithful in the tithe that God said, I'm challenging you in your offering. It's tithe and offering. I'll never forget, I got an invitation to preach at a place I've been dying to preach at. I didn't tell the first service this, I'm telling you. I've been dying to preach. I said, oh, if they ever call me to preach, I'm going. Finally get the call to go preach at this place. And I get the call to go preach there. And I had actually already had another church scheduled to preach the day that this person called me to preach. And uh, one of my friends in these prayer, he's like, bro, you better go. You better cancel that other church. I said, I can't do that. So I already made my commitment. I said, I can't call that pastor and just ask him, would you mind like switching the dates? I really want to preach at this place. It's kind of a bucket list place for me. I called the pastor. pastor said, I said, but I gave you my word first, but if you want me, I'll honor my commitment. The pastor said, are you kidding me? Duh, go preach there. I went there and preached. Finished preaching, they handed me an honorarium. It was the largest honorarium to that point that I'd ever got. I looked at the check, I said, oh my goodness. And I'm telling you, like clockwork, God spoke to me. And he goes, could I have all of it? I said, devil, I rebuke you. I t <laughs> all of it. Hold on, we got a system that's been working. Take your 10, don't be greedy. <laughs> I'm telling the truth. I said, hold up. <laughs> he said, can I have all of it? I'll never forget it. I, I'm embarrassed to admit this to you. I, I struck. I, 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 this was a big check. <laughs> I said, oh, yeah. He just asked, just like that. I felt it in my spirit. You know when God's speaking to you. He said, can I have all of it? True story. I said, well, I was serving at a church at the time. I said, well, if... <laughs> Because he was specific. The church I was a part of was having a campaign to give to the children's. He said, would you give me all of it? So it ended that. I said, right. I said okay, okay, Lord, if, if. <laughs> no, you start doing stuff to see if it's really him. I said, if, if my pastor texts me and ask how it went, <laughs> and ask about my pledge, because it was coming up for the pledge for that, then I'll do it. Because my pastor, he, he, he didn't, I'm, next day, my pastor, hey! Hey! How was it at the church? I said, ah! He said, do you know your pledge yet? I said, yeah. I do. It's that. He said, wow. I said, I know. <laughs> I'm telling you, it hurt. I'll never forget it. Never forget it. So did. Do you know, I preached at that place multiple times. That was the first time. Do you know, when God blessed us to build our home, and they sent me the landscaping bill, and it was due like in December, and don't nobody call evangelists to speak in December. It is cold in December when you travel because people just have Christmas cantatas. <laughs> I get a call for the, and the check was the exact amount we needed for our landscaping. And I felt God going, you thought you could outgive me. I'm not telling you something that I don't know. Tell me something I have lived. 
God wants to know, can I get it first? And here's what's crazy, just like I just told you. How many know if you trust them with the cube, trust them with the square, God says, okay, you're getting it. Let me, if you did it with the cubes, let me see if I can do it with the cheeses. And he'll give you 10, and all he asks is that you give me one. God said, oh, you're going to trust me with cheeses? All right. Can you trust me with Cheetos? I'm bringing different things because I want to be clear. How many of you know the harvest is not always money? Yeah. This is what preachers jack it up. It is not always money. You don't know how God is going to return it back to you. He just gave you a promise that I'm going to rebuke the devourer and I'm going to make sure I restore the blessing. The issue is not just getting the money. There are some things money cannot buy. You cannot buy peace. You cannot buy joy. They don't sell that at Neiman Marcus. There are some things that money cannot buy. It's not always money. God said, you're going to trust me with the cheese cubes? You're going to trust me with the cheeses? Can I trust you with Cheetos? And they'll give you 10. And all he asks, 10%. And God goes, all right. I can trust him with the Cheetos. But, this is for the ghetto people. Can I trust you with the flame of hot Cheetos? I'm going somewhere. Because how many you know, when you start getting blessed and God starts taking you to new levels, sometimes the people forget the blessing that got them into the place and they start getting more stingy the more God starts blessing. But just because you're flaming hot now, don't stop. It's an opportunity for you to be more generous. Oh, I'm you, it's, like, it's like the guy that started the business and just stepped out on faith was making $50,000 a year. He didn't even think he would make that much and just faithful with the tithe. God starts blessing his business, blessing his business. All of a sudden, that business starts bringing in $3.2 million a year. $3.2 million. And he calls his pastor like, Pastor, I got to talk to you. Pastor like, what's up? He's like, man, you know, you, you talk about the tithe and all that. And I stepped out. I trusted God. He's like, but yo, it was one thing when it's like $50,000. He's like, it's $3.2 million now. He's like, yo, 10% of 3.2 is a whole lot. He's like, Pastor, I'm just, I'm being dead serious. Just pray for me. I'm really struggling on the 10% on the 3.2. So the pastor, crazy, old school pastor, he said, oh, I'm going to pray for you. Pastor, everybody here. He said, God, I pray that you take him right back to 50,000. I said, God, take away the 3.2. If he can't trust you with the 3.2, take him back to 50,000. He's like, no, nah, don't pray no more. I'm good. I'm Don't stop when your income gets hot. Don't stop. It's the beauty of tithe. It's that the 10 is the same for everybody. It's a sacrifice for everybody. God made it equal. He said, you're going to trust me with the flame and hot? You're going to trust me with the Cheetos, Cheetos and the cheeses? He said, you know what? I'm about to bless you with some cheesecake. Because I can trust you. It's a test. Somebody say it's a test. Cheesecake. And all God asks is for <laughs> ten. Let me set it up nice. Look <laughs> at all that's yours. And look at all that God has. Do whatever you want with this. God said, trust me with this. Because when you give me this, and not just give it, and not just bring it, because it's none of it's yours. When you bring it, it puts a blessing on all of this. I'm preaching better y'all are talking. I'm going to land the plane. Worship team, join. I know some of y'all in here, you're theologians, you're biblically astute, and you know how to extrapolate the complexities hidden within the crevices of a biblical composition. So I hear you, ah, oh, well, Robert, those were all Old Testament references, and I, I'm not under the law. <laughs> I'm under grace. So save your little tithe speech. I'm under grace. It's not in the New Testament. A word? It's 
about to mess you up. Not only is tithing in the New Testament, let's even back it up further than that. To say that I'm not under law, I'm under grace, grace actually has a greater demand than the law. But it's not out of religious effort, it's out of looking at the goodness and the faithfulness of God that I actually want to do more. So grace is always a mandate to do more. Ten is the minimum. Grace says, oh, God, you've been so good to me. I can do more than 10%. I I'm looking for opportunities because I know how good you've been. But if you need an example, here's one. I could give you more, but let's do red letter. Straight from Jesus. Matthew 23, verse 23. This is Jesus talking. He says, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law? And you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. That is Jesus talking. Jesus in the New Testament after the law. And say, yo, Pharisees, you're hypocrites because you're real good at tithing and you should tithe, but then you use tithing as an excuse to neglect justice, to neglect mercy, and to neglect love. He said the New Testament where you're under grace, it doesn't require you just to do the minimum. You need to go above and beyond. You should tithe and you should fight against injustice. You should tithe and you should stand up for loving your neighbor as yourself. You should tithe and you should plead for mercy. Oh God, give us a generation that won't just tithe, but says, and I'll go above and beyond and I'll be generous and I'll be generous with my time and generous with my voice and I'll fight for those that have no voice and I'll fight for those who are marginalized and I'll fight for those that don't have a say. The tithe is the minimum. Grace says I could do more. When you look in the face of Jesus and you know what he's done for you, how can your life not be an open hand? This is the character of God, for he so loved that he gave. This is not about a preacher trying to hoodwink you. This is about God trying to get a flow of blessing through you. That's Matthew. That's Jesus talking. Can I give you a revelation that hit me at like 1 a.m.? Matthew wrote that. And Matthew was a tax collector. <laughs> Let me just pause right there before I even go further. Let me answer this question. Do you tithe? on the gross or the net? Which one? Well, let me answer that question with a question. Why do you have net instead of gross? It's because when you look at your check, they already take it out. It's like the person that looked at his check and then grabbed his gun. Like, where you going, bro? To get Fika. I don't know who Fika is, but Fika took some of my money. The government doesn't even trust you to take it out. They take it out for you. God says, I, I, I trust you. I'm trying to trust you to bring it. Matthew's a tax collector. He's good with numbers. And I love that the verse in the New Testament where Jesus talks about the tithe is in Matthew 23, 23. Matthew 23, 23. Of all the numbers. 23, 23, because you know two, plus three, plus two, plus three. It's ten. God goes, can you trust me? Trust me with the 10. I can do more with the 90, and you'll never know it unless you taste and see that I am good. Would you stand to your feet today? This is a message. And I believe if you could capture this today, it would change your life forever. It's not something that I've heard about. It's something that I've seen with my own eyes. Grace causes me to do more. Ten is the minimum. I'm not going to read it, but 
You remember Zacchaeus? The wee little man? The wee little man was he? We sing that little cute Sunday school song, we forget how scandalous Zacchaeus was. Picture in your mind anybody that you consider a sellout and a traitor. They don't scratch the surface when it comes to Zacchaeus. Taking money from his own people to give to the very people that oppressed his people. He was the lowest of the low. So low. Everywhere he went, people despised him. People got mad because one day Jesus, grace, said, come out of that tree. I'm coming to the house that you manipulated and robbed people to get. I'm going to sit on the furniture that you took advantage of your own people to buy. I'm coming to your house. Luke chapter 19, read it when you get home. Just the fact that Jesus went to his house, the whole crowd muttered, how dare he go eat with a sinner like if he knew who he was. I'm telling you, you have to understand the time period, how hated Zacchaeus was. It's the equivalent of going to a sex trafficker's house. Somebody that has taken advantage of people. See, people don't like to talk about how crazy grace is. His grace is crazy. It doesn't make sense. Jesus said, I'm going to go to your house. Goes to his house and there was an uproar. But just the fact that grace went to his house, looked him in the eyes. Do you know what Zacchaeus said? Actually, let's put it on the screen. Zacchaeus, the one that robbed, the one that manipulated. All the people muttered, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Four times the amount. Do you see the power of the grace of Jesus Christ? Jesus didn't look at him and say, you ought to pay it back. You're so messed up. Jesus didn't look at him and try to manipulate. No, he just had an encounter with a real and living Savior. And when he looked in the face of grace, without anybody trying to manipulate him, without Jesus saying anything, just to see the kindness and the grace and the generosity of Jesus made him say, look, I'll pay back four times the amount because God's been so good to me. Come on, how many of you know when you get a revelation of the grace of God, it'll make you be generous because you know how good he's been to you. You're thankful that amazing grace would save a wretch like you. You won't just give money. You'll give forgiveness. You'll give love. You'll give whatever you have because you know what's been given to you. Can't look at the face of grace and not be generous. And it starts saying, God, I trust you with the tithe and then with the How can a man rob God? Robbery is when you take something by force. It's not theft, which is just to take something. It's not burglary, which is to go into somebody's home. To rob is to take by force. How can you rob God? He, he has all power, all force. He must be saying something deeper. But he says, how can you rob me? I think he's saying you're robbing me of an opportunity to bless you. You're robbing me of an opportunity. You're settling for the sample when I've got a surplus. Settling for a piece when I've got so much more. This is a plea to somebody today who says, man, I'm struggling God to trust you. God says, start with your resources. Test me. Do the taste test and see will I not open up the windows of heaven. Pour you out a blessing you won't have room enough to receive. Would you bow your heads, Father? I, I thank you for your word. God, I pray I did my part. God, I pray that the truth of your word minister to the hearts of your people. God, I know so many people have negative viewpoints on church and with money. As a matter of fact, God, I pray you would use social Dallas, 
God, as we stand in integrity, God, use this church and this community to heal the hearts of those who've been on the other end of leaders who have manipulated, leaders who've been greedy. But God, I pray we won't allow the enemy to talk us out of a principle in your word that you said you rebuke the devourer. God, that you would restore the blessing. God, help our church to live with an open hand. Heads are still bowed, eyes are closed. I'm, I'm not even going to have you raise your hand or anything, but I do want you to ask yourself, what is the Holy Spirit saying to you through this message today? God wants you to trust him. It starts with your treasure. You don't have anything. All that we have comes from him. And in a very practical way, some of you, again, this is not a message of condemnation. Some of you say, I don't know if I can do 10. Just start. Start with five. Start with six. Go to 10, but just start. Say, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to issue a challenge to some of you today. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. But I want somebody to literally do the taste test. Since this is the only place in Scripture where God says, test me in it, I want you to do a 90-day test. Do a 90-day test. Say, God, okay, I'm doing the taste test. Every check, 10%, I'm going to sow it into the storehouse. The storehouse, every theologian will tell you, is the house of God, the place where you get fed. It's amazing how many of us would never go to a restaurant and skip out on the check. But you know how many people come to church week after week, receive ministry, receive a word from the Lord, and they never invest in the place that feeds them? This is the only place in Gillies where you don't pay anything to come in. And yet you won't have a problem any concert doing it, but see the trick of the enemy when it comes to church? Oh no, don't do that. See the trick. It's the only place. And this is not about God getting money. God doesn't need your money. And I'll tell you, social doesn't need your money. God is the miraculous. He can do anything. He's trying to get something to you and through you. So I, want, I want to challenge you. Do a 90-day test to say, God, I'm going to trust you with 10%. And after that 90 days, if you are not in a greater place of blessing or if you're worse off, let us know. Let us know. I want you to send an email, and I'll read it. Just see what the email says. Hey, preacher, tried it. Didn't work. But I know that you're going to walk in greater blessing because God said put it to the test. For some of you, that's a challenge. Just try 90 days. If you're worse off, okay. But I'm telling you, it's going to open up the window of heaven when you honor him first.